Hello all. I hope you guys are doing good. Give me one second. Okay, how is everybody? Good, we are early. Good. Good. We are early, so we get to chitty chat until everybody else shows up. I just walked out there. I sent doing grocery shopping. Anybody wants to ask me how many bags of tomatoes we have? How no. many? Ask me how many bags of five. Why? Carrots? Different Carrots. types of tomatoes? Yeah, five bags of tomatoes. Nice. Carrots, we have three bags of carrots. Um, apples, we have three bags of apples. Um, strawberries, we have two sets of strawberries. And that, that's the extent of the things that I saw. I almost, and mind you, we got this like fancy fridge, right? That speaks seven languages, but it's only yay deep. So nothing fits in there and everything's gonna expire before even, you get to eat it all? I don't even think we can put the groceries away. So next thing, he's going to have to go buy another fridge just to put all those groceries exactly. in. Exactly. So I called him and I said, uh, I said, we need another fridge. And Dwayne goes, that's not an option because the circuit in the garage can even handle the freezer, let alone if I buy another. <laughs> <laughs> oh, grown up, grown up problems. Fine. Right? I'm like, Love seriously, it. honey. Like I sent him a video. I'm like, what do we need three bags of tomatoes for? Like three, five, five yeah. bags of tomatoes for. So I guess uh, you all know what I'm eating for the next few days. It's going to yeah. be tomato sandwich. It's going to be bruschetta. It is going to be, uh, what the other thing I like, homemade salsa. I'm going to put those tomatoes. I'm going to be really healthy and acidic because tomatoes are really acidic. So now I'm going to have to find some alkaline foods to go along yeah. with this tomato diet. It's so um, funny. Um, okay. Before we get started, go go. Can we make sure that we make um, Randy a co-host so that he can? He needs absolutely a so that he yeah. starts his presentation, and we need to feed it live still, right? Oh yes, and then I was just waiting to be at the hour. Perfect. And uh, give me one second, Randy Gamble. There you are. Okay, make co-host and allow to share. Toby, you're gonna start though. I don't see your handsome face. There you are. Awesome. I feel like I talk to you almost every day for a while and I haven't talked to you in like two months. I know. Where'd you go? I know. I, I, I do have to have a call with you, though. We have to go through that trust here in a second when we have time. So everyone, this is Toby Mathis, one of the best, well, tax attorneys was really a, a, a know-it-all, right? Um, and I love working with them. He's, thank you. He's the, if I, correct me, um, Toby, if I'm wrong, but you're one of the founders of Anderson's, right? Mm hmm 24 years now. That's awesome. So we got, I got him um, as one of my advisors, which I feel very, very excited and happy about. He uh, helped me getting all of our systems in places, all of the companies and the right organizations and LLC versus ESCO versus partnership, all of those things, make sure we have a trust, make sure everything feeds in to the right place, right? It's not perfect just yet. And I don't know if it's ever going to be, uh, especially if I keep opening companies, right, Toby? You're a moving target. That's the thing. <laughs> exactly. We never, we never get to the end of it. But um, what are you going to teach about today? So usually, guys, just so you know, we are starting the first um, five minutes to open to the public with Toby. He's going to bring something of value on the tech side or legal side of being an entrepreneur. And so, Toby, take it from here. Yeah, I, I really want to hit just three things and I'll do it real quick. Uh, number one, I'm a real estate investor. I have over 300 pieces of property myself uh, with my partner that we own, uh, everything from apartment buildings on down. You're going to be hearing about the meltdown. You're going to be continuing to hear all this stuff. You guys probably already know this, that a lot of that is just a bunch of wackadoodle talk, although it sometimes brings about the very thing that they're complaining about or scared about if they keep complaining about it. But um, Defaults, there's bad information out there about uh, foreclosure rates. They're really, really low percentage wise year over year. It might look bad in some cases, like depending on which data you look at, it can be 100% higher. But that's like if there was one last year and there's two now, it's not like 
a big percentage, small number, but it's still a fraction. I think we're at uh, 0.5% of people with mortgages potentially underwater, but they have an average equity of 180,000. So those aren't going into nasty foreclosure where you have short sales and stuff. These are people that have a ton of equity in houses. I'm sorry, it's just not gonna be another bloodbath like it was in 2007 and eight. I only say that because I sit on the opposite side. I'm usually working on the business side with larger clients. I mean, GoGo is a great example. And uh, we have to look at the actual data instead of the hyperbole that gets thrown out there in the media. We're still significantly underbuilt. And I'll just tell you, again, I'm one of those bleeding hearts that believes that individual investors have to fix the problem of homelessness because Wall Street, you know, BlackRock's buying up everything in there. You know, that they're looking at one thing that, that they're going to be focusing on as far as a return. And the little investor can actually make money doing things with the with the uh, with, with the smaller investors. Hold so, on one second, Toby. Um, yeah. Randy, can you stop sharing for a second until it's your turn, please? If you could just hit the stop share button for now. There should be a red. There we go. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I know that's not what you want me on here for, Gogo, -Go, but I just wanted to mention that. It just goes without saying. I, again, I look at this stuff all day long. And well, thank uh, you. So I actually wrote down, did you say 0.5% of foreclosures? And, yeah. But they still have about 180,000 in equity. That's very different in 2008 when right. everybody was upside down. Oh, I lived it. I was in Vegas for 2007 and 8, 9 and 10, and I was buying everything I could get my hands on there for a period of time. I screwed up. Yeah. Like, like, that was my big mistake was I should have just kept everything because the properties I kept, they're up three or four hundred percent plus they paid for themselves, you know, already with the with the rents. Um, I just want you guys to know, because if you're an agent, you're out there and you're hearing it and all of a sudden you could hear like sales are way down. Kind of like you're I think that the average list, at least here, is lower, like it, it's actually decreased year over year even though there's not as many bidding wars and people are lowering the prices, they're staying on the market for less. And I don't know what you guys are seeing, but I look at that saying there's no inventory. There's lots of demand, there's no inventory. So there's more inventory than a year ago in some cases, but they're still selling really fast. And so I just don't buy into the hype. Usually if it's being said on TV, I think they're full of crap. Um, they have an agenda. I haven't, they, turned the yeah, I haven't turned the TV on, I couldn't tell you one. And the federal, uh, I mean, I'll just tell you, again, legal standpoint, they, they passed laws after the last pandemic about your qualifications for a mortgage. The average credit score, and I, you know, I don't have the link here, but the average credit score is about 100% higher on a mortgage, plus they have equity and a lot of equity. So I just, again, don't believe the hype. They're going to, we will crash the economy, but it's because the Fed's raising interest rates and they're, and they have to do that because we have this weird thing of inflation outpacing um, I think it's almost two to one that's outpacing wage growth. So people can't afford anything. So they're just getting smacked upside the head. So the, the five bags of tomatoes that, that GoGo -Go just bought are a lot more expensive than last year. Guys, we paid, I don't know if it's last year or I don't know if it's location. Usually our grocery bills in Michigan were between three and $400. Dwayne just bought groceries. Granted, I don't think we usually buy five bags of tomatoes. But our bills was 300 something versus 900 something down here. So that could be inflation plus location, right? But I'm like $900. That means that's 4000 If we grocery shop once a week, that's $4,000 a month for groceries. You guys eat a lot. I mean, I do have teenage boys versus little boys, right? They eat more than what they used to eat, but goodness gracious. So um, give us one tip that we need to know. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys a good one right now because we're getting awesome. up towards the end of tax season. So 2021 taxes, if you haven't done them, good. If you have done them, don't fret. There's like there's still some things that you could do if you wanted to. One of the big ones for agents is a lot of folks are still operating as a sole proprietor. And all that means is that you don't have a separate tax return for your business. It's going on your 1040, your regular tax form, and it's going on your Schedule E. Uh, I just want to show you guys real quick. And I'm just going to share my screen for two seconds. It's not going to be sophisticated. I'm just showing you uh, a, a tip, an, an actual screen. And what you can see in this, hopefully you can see it, is that if I was simply making an S election, let's say I'm an LLC, 
my accountant is just putting it on my regular tax return. I don't know. Like it, it, if when I say, hey, how are you structured? You say, I don't know. You're 70% of people are sole proprietors. So that's probably where you're at. You're just paying a lot more in tax. So if I just put side by side, just making an S selection on the same exact business, somebody making 50 grand a year, it literally lowers your tax bill by $4,000, a little over 4,000. And that's without the other benefits of being an S corp. So I'm just going to say, if you have an accountant who's continuing to keep you as an S corp, you may want to switch. I mean, as continuing well, I, to be a sole proprietor, you may want to switch. I have a question on that one, because even my CP, I was asking for a long time, right, to be an S corp versus a, a sole proprietor, proprietor, I can't say that word. And he always said, well, you're not there just yet. So what is, well, not always, eventually I was there just yet, right? But for a long time, he said, you're not there just yet. So what is that determination factor that they decided yeah. what point should someone switch to sole proprietor? I'll, I'll show I, you. I can't is, see that. I'm just going to say SP. This uh, is 25,000. Versus, yeah. Okay. This is, this is 25,000. It's over 1,500 bucks. And that's without the other benefits. An S Corp, now you become an employee of an S Corp. So it can do an accountable plan and reimburse you for 100% of your cell phone, for any of your equipment in your house, for your internet that you use as a real estate agent, anything that you drive now between your house and to any meeting, anything, anywhere, even if you have another office at another facility is, is deductible. Right now it's 62 cents a mile. Like you're literally lighting money on fire if you're not doing that. You can't do those same things as a sole proprietor. And what, what most accountants are doing when they're saying stay as a sole proprietor is they're yeah. saying, I don't know the difference. Uh -huh. That's what he's saying. Because a sole proprietor is 800% more likely to be audited than an S corp. A sole proprietorship loses its audits 95% of the time. It was 94% uh, uh, correspondence audits, 95% of the time in field audits. They lost because it's, uh -huh. it's literally... You can't write off much. You have to show that it was a business uh, purpose, which means you have to be documenting the who, what, where, what, when, and why. And nobody does that. Let's just be real. I know you guys are because you're real estate agents. And for whatever hey, reason- Let me change Let me change the view. This is one of my favorite, right? So we'll ch I'll change the view to Gally. Okay, raise your hand if you track, if you're a sole proprietor, sole proprietor, Somebody say that word for me. An SP, raise your hand if you're an SP. Ooh, okay. So we have about, okay, so good chunk on the first page. And that's the only page I see. Okay. So let's say 40% of the agents here are SPs. Okay. Now raise your hand if you track every time you get into that car and you write down the address and your mileage, and then you get to your location, you write down the address of the location and your mileage. Then you get back to the car, you write down the address of where you took off from, and then the mileage at the time, and then you get to that next location and you write down the address in the mileage. That's what you're supposed to be doing if you're so, that, and that's just your mileage. You're supposed to be saying why you're doing it too. Yeah, yeah. use- What use, client you showed houses to. So if you're not doing that and you get audited, as he said, nine, you have a 5% chance of winning that audit. That you're gonna win. Yeah, you get, you yeah. get hosed. Use my IQ. Someone just put it in there. Christy, yeah. you're 100% right. I use my IQ. <laughs> but even in my IQ, you have to swipe all day. Like as a realtor, we no, drive all the time. You swipe can set left, it up. You right. can set up. You can set up between certain spaces and it'll track it automatically. It just knows that it's a business. I know, but like it doesn't know that I don't even know what houses I'm going to show tomorrow. Yeah, that's true. You got to you know do what I mean? So how, would, how am I supposed to set up that thing? It's not like I drive to the office. And even and he, and what I was told, then you cannot write off driving to an office. So driving to an office and driving back home, it's not All a right. This is where it gets really cool. You're right. If you're if you are a sole proprietor and you have a place to work, you can't write it you off. Can't write it off. Right. But you if can't. you're an S corp and you your administrative office where you do your management activities is in your home. And then you have a second office where you do all your sales, you can write off that as, as a business travel because you have an administrative office in your home. There's four exceptions to that, that rule where, they, where they're where they doing the sole proprietorship, but you have to be an employee of an organization, not be a sole proprietor, right? Yeah. Then it can reimburse you. Uh, you can reimburse your maid if you have somebody coming in for your house, a portion of it. We usually get about 20%. We can reimburse your 
property taxes. We can reimburse your internet, your utilities, your gas, your massive electric bill, go, go, because you're going to have three freezers and six refrigerators. But all Don't that stuff. Me started. Don't even... We're going to have to replace Dwayne if he doesn't learn how to grocery shop. You can write off Dwayne. <laughs> He's an expense at this point. <laughs> but thank you so much. So, Toby, what is the best way for everybody or anybody that wants to um, work with you guys and understand? Actually, I think um, Christy included the link, if I'm I remember gonna correctly. Them, I'm going to give him your short link. So I have an aba.link forward slash gogo, and I'm just going to shoot it out there. Awesome. Perfect. Your link, gogo, so we know it's one of your people, so that we know it's real estate and we know what you guys are doing. There's about 500 here, uh, 500 of us at our firm, just to give you an idea. We wanna make sure that you're working with somebody specifically who knows real estate uh, and especially on the agent side, cause it's a completely different animal. But there's hundreds of little tricks like that. And the only people that know are the ones that actually do it all day. So a lot of people go to their local accountant, no offense to the local accountant, but they've probably never been a real estate agent. They probably never invested in real estate. There's <laughs> lots of nuances there. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Toby, thank you so much for your time, guys. The link is included. Get your appointment. All you need to do is just show up, right? Ask your question. If they're not a right fit, that's the end of that. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. Go get them. My Andy pleasure. Camel, are you ready? Oh, he is. Speak. Oh, look at that. Oh, it's going to be fancy. <laughs> Okay, let's do this. Touch those little space. Yep. And then the chair. Yep. And now you're good to go. All right, guys. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So we're gonna have a lot of fun today, guys. We're gonna go over really in granular detail how and why you should use national mortgage home loans. We're gonna go over some secrets as to why we should use that national mortgage home loans and how difficult right now it seems, especially with, with the market and where it's going on what we do differently than other lenders. But first, I'm gonna give you a little intro to myself, okay, guys? And you guys can hear me okay, go, go, we're good? Yep, we good. Perfect, all right. So guys, first of all, most important reason uh, we do things every day is for family. This is my family. Here's a little bio about who I am, uh, what I'm about. Again, I'm about family. Uh, probably the most important thing any of you guys work, this is, this is my why. So this is why we treat the company like family. This is why we put an importance on being with your family. Again, one of the most important things. This gives you a little bit of bio of my background and things like that. But again, this is my why, and I'm sure it's a lot of your why's also, okay? Who are we? That's me. That's my business partner. It's also my brother. Again, more family. These people over here are some of our key people that help us grow as an organization. We have a lot more people that we've added on since. That being said, again, these are the people that really push on the back end when it comes to process and things like that. So we're not the shop. You see a lot of broker shops that you go to. Like, well, we're not the big bank. They don't have a lot of staff. Guys, we have a lot of staff and we keep adding more staff because we want to make sure you have that support. So it's very, very important. Where are we licensed? I've had this question a lot. You guys want to take a picture of this? This is where we currently do business. All the states in the red is where we're currently licensed. The states in the white are the ones that are in application right now. So if you guys want or you ever have any questions, you can take a picture of this so you can reference it. It's also on our website, just so you guys know, okay? Now, what's really happening in the market? So you see all the red over here? That's the areas that are saying are gonna go down in property values. Uh, areas in Arizona, areas in California, you know, Washington, uh, uh, Utah, areas in Michigan, this is Metro Detroit right there, they're saying it's gonna come down property values. Guys, this is saying, obviously what you're seeing now, it's not a seller's market anymore. This changed in three months. In three months, you saw that you guys were fighting to get offers approved, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, your offers approved. You were fighting and giving everything and your firstborn child just to get something, just to get an offer accepted. There was in some cases 40, 50 offers, which is absolutely incredible. Today, the market shifted a little bit. Property values are saying are, are gonna come down. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna make your buyer's offers more attractive in today's market versus what it was just three or four months ago. Okay, guys? Now look at the trends in the interest rates. Where were interest rates prior and where are they today? If you take a look at this trend, go ahead and 
Let's draw a little bit on here. If you take a look at this trend and where interest rates were, look at this, guys. In 1994, interest rates hovered around 8%, 8 percent, 8 and 9 percent. Home buying was still at an all-time high. Fast forward to 2002, interest rates, 2003, in this area, interest rates started coming down to 5, 5.5%. In 2006, we started seeing interest rates up between 6 and 7%. There was the biggest absolute catastrophe when it came to mortgages ever in the history of the United States since the Great Depression. But what happened? Two years later, home prices rebounded. When your client says to you, are we going to have this same crash that we had back in 2006, 2007? Say no. Why? Back in 2006 and 2007, loan officers weren't required to be licensed. Banks were giving loans and selling them as prime A paper on Wall Street with 0% down, 580 FICO scores. A waiter at Denny's was able to buy a $600,000 house. All the checks and balances, unfortunately, with some of the positive, there were some negative, but the Frank Dodd Act and some of the other acts that were passed allowed more licensing and more regulation in the mortgage side of things, allowed for tightening on the mortgage side of things. So in that case, you're not going to see the same things happen back then, happen today. What happened? Tightening, uh, mortgage tightening, uh, mortgage rule licensing and tightening, uh, mortgage rules got more tight. What happened? Conventional loans, FHA loans came back. The zero down program went away. They didn't allow people to get a home with no skin in the game. They didn't allow the stated programs with zero down. So you're not going to see the same negative effect you saw back in 2006 and 2007. So I want you to rest assured. Is the market going to crash? No, the market's not going to crash. Is there going to, is there going to be a market softening? Yes, there could be a 3 to 5% year over year market softening. But we're already seeing indications that the rates will get better next year. The Fed is meeting today. At that Fed meeting, we should see a 0.75 adding to current interest rates. That means interest rates are going to go up by 75 basis points. That could affect interest rates adversely in the way that interest rates will rise a quarter to three eighths of a point with a terrible overreaction from the market. That's if the market begins to slide or, or things like there's so many things that, that come into play. But we could see interest rates climb as soon as today. But guys, rest assured again. Interest rates will come down over time and everything will, will, will level up. Okay. So when you're applying that, I have, asks, a, that, I have a quick place? question on that. Yeah. So if you're looking at like 1994 and before, it looks like interest rates stayed right around 9% for almost like two years, right? Or three years. Yeah. Do you, what, what do you, right now we are at like almost six, right? So what do you think? How, how, I mean, I know this is stipulation, but in your personal professional opinion, yeah. where, how high do you think you see this going up? The interest rate? Are rates? we ever going to see a 9%? No, I think you're going to see a 7.5% interest rate at its peak. And then I think by, by June of next year, right around there, interest rates will begin to taper off. I think uh, what's happening now, when you have this level of inflation, and everyone says we're in a super bubble, what's happening is, the only thing the Fed knows how to do, which the crazy thing is, they're not even following their own advice. They're following the advice of other firms to say, when should we raise or lower interest rates? So they don't even have any real indication themselves of when to lower or raise interest rates. So what they do is they follow a lot of the major firms that decide what's happening with the market. So what they did now is, for example, inflation is at an all time high. So they said, hey, let's let's keep raising key interest rates, 25 basis points, 50 basis points. Today, you're going to see the largest increase in the Fed rate that you've seen in, in a very long time. 75 basis points is expected. They're just trying to taper inflation. In their heads, they're saying if we raise the key interest rates enough, it'll calm down inflation. Well, the market's already caught up to that idea. So it's not really going to work the way that they want. You're not going to see the market surge on this news. They want the market to surge, but it's not going to surge because the surging already started because they're already anticipating the 75 basis points. <laughs> so can you explain us what 75 basis points mean? Because I feel like that's more of a loan officer term versus a realtor term. That's a great question. So let's say, for example, the key interest rate is, we'll call it 4%. 4% 4 is 400 basis points. If we're raising it 0.75 basis points or 0.75%, what that means is we're raising it 75 out of 100 basis points. 75 basis points would be equal to 0.75%. 
So if we're talking in basis points, 400 or 4% is 400 basis points, a 0.75 would mean it would be 4.75. Got it, okay, thank you. No problem. Um, so if you guys look today, like this is the biggest thing when I ask you guys, like, you know, get your buyers off the fence. Hey, we're going to go ahead and, and, and we're going to tell them this is the time to buy. Well, here's the biggest thing, guys. Watch this. Beginning of 2022, interest rates were 3%. Today they're over, well, they're in some cases, 6%. That's a huge difference. And we're going to go over how that interest difference looks very shortly. Oops, I'm sorry, let me get out of that. January 2022, interest rates were 3.45%. Today, interest rates are 5.54 on average, we'll call it. Guys, take a look at this. Let me see if I can do this Zoom stuff I'm trying to learn, hold on. Take a look at this. Can you guys see this pretty well, would you say? No, no, definitely not, hold on. We can see 607,000. There you go. Can you see this now? $400,000 loan amount, 30 year term. We talk about this almost weekly. PI payment, PI means principal and interest payment is $1,686. Take Check out the total principal and interest, $607,000, 109. Total interest, $207,000. If you look at the amortization, the breakdown of the principal versus the interest, it shows you how much interest is paid and how much principal is paid on the first year, two, three, four. So if you guys look, an interest on a $400,000 loan, we only paid $11,885 in interest, $8,351 in principal, right? Very, very interest heavy. We pay more interest than we do principal because the interest rate is so low. Watch what happens on the next example. Though. This is crazy. You see, guys see the right side now? Loan amount of 400,000, 30 year. Now watch this. Total principal and interest, $806,000. Dollars. Holy shit, the total interest is six thousand. Check this out. Interest 406. Check out what happened to the interest in principal in the first year. Twenty-one thousand dollars versus fifty five hundred in principal paid. That's what happens when you double those interest rates. That's huge. That's mind blowing. So you want to get your buyer off the fence, show them that number. They'll love this. This is a great way. They say, hey, the market's going to soften three to four percent. Well, shit, how about the doubling of your interest rate that just caused you to spend four times more on interest versus principal? It's huge, huge. That's insane. I cannot believe that you pay almost 50% of interest on an $820,000 house. Well, do you know what somebody will say to you is uh, it's a great interest rate off. Guys, those are limited also. And I'm sure, I think Toby's his name. He'll explain that to you next time. So you can't write off like every bit of interest and the thing is, it's always, it always makes sense to get the lowest interest rate possible. Great. We do, again, see in the next three years, interest rates will come down, hopefully, I'm assuming, to the levels that they were back in January. But we don't know. We don't have a crystal ball, right? So we're just going to advise you to do it. You know, what can you do to win? Well, to, to win, you got to know this stuff. Take a picture of this. Show this to your client. Just take this thing and send it out to them. And show them this is how higher interest looks. I told you to go off the fence in January and you didn't. And you know what? Interest rates can go up again. It's five and a half today. They could be seven. They could be seven and a half. And after today's meeting is a great time to reach out to your, your buyers and tell them. After today's meeting, you will definitely see an interest hike. So now is a good time to get in front of them, show them this illustration, and you know try to get them off the fence. So any questions about that? I think we got it. I mean, they can always refinance, even if, if they... Um you know, buy it at the height of the market, right? Because you have to live somewhere. Like, Absolutely. what are you going to do? The next option of living under the bridge with three kids and a dog and a parrot, it's not really a good option, Yeah. right? Yeah. So that means you have to do it no matter what. Even if it's a height of the market, then refinance in two years when it comes down. Absolutely. And that's, that's another thing. Like, we never want to advise, like, knowing that rate interest rates are going to come down. But at the same time, um, we want to set a realistic expectation based on history. And I showed you guys the history. Usually what goes up must come down. Interest rates will come down in the next five years, hands down, in my opinion. And I've been doing this for, you guys saw, 21 years or so. So um, next slide, what is this over here? So, you know, all this, all this being said, why work with, you know, National Mortgage or another great broker or lender in the area? Guys, to beat the competition, you got to be better than the competition. That's where we excel. Closing loans quickly, knowing what we're doing, 
having a robust staff to be able to get your loans from start to finish as fast as possible is the most important things. Now, how does that look? What, is that, what does that really mean? So over here, you see unbelievable, impossible, incredible business as usual. Over here, actually stays we closed in 18 days or less. We actually got that number down in the past 60 days to 13 days or less. 13 days or less average CTC from start to finish. How does that look? Over here- Are you like, talking in a, like a conventional FHA, 13 days? We can do, so our FHA right now is 15 and a half days and our conventional is 13 days. Wow, you can close in two weeks. So we can, so when a lot of, a lot of agents, a lot of, uh, a lot of your downline go goes ask, hey, can we close this loan in nine or 10 days? We'll say, yeah, if, if it makes sense. If there's no like condo questionnaire or if it's not in a bad place as an appraisal, yeah, we, we can absolutely do that. You know, we don't want to, we don't want you to hold a uh, contractual obligation to do that. But if we say 10 days, go ahead and put on there two weeks. If we commit to it, we're going to close that loan. There hasn't been one person in your downline or anybody else's I know of where we said, hey, we'll close it. We don't close it. And a lot of times we fix other banks issues where they're like, hey, well, I have a great relationship with this bank. Oh, Randy, they just messed me up. They couldn't close the loan. Can you take it over and close it? We've probably done it three times in the past two months where we fixed a bank's issue 30 to 45 days in process. Um, and they brought the loan over. We closed it in less than three weeks. And I think, I think, like I said, some of your downline can definitely testify to that. So um, how does it look on the back end? You know, what, what are we doing on the back end, guys? We're importing a 3.2 link file. I'm going to show you what that means, okay? Um, E-signing. What that means is your client doesn't have to sign. You know, it's a very simple package. They, they send it out. They go through the signatures. Literally, it's done in probably six minutes or less. Submit the loan to underwriting. Here's the cool thing about it, right? Once that's done, we take that loan immediately within the hour, and we submit it over to underwriting at the bank. Once that's done, we get an approval within 24 hours. So it's very realistic to say we submitted that loan on Monday to underwriting. And in a lot of cases, if we have an appraisal waiver, which I'll talk to you about, we got to clear to close before Friday, which is, it's mind blowing. You know, five business days, you got to clear. Yeah, we've done it in one or two. So it's, it's, it's really a nice phenomenon, especially when you go back to listing and say, I told you so. Or you go back to your buyer and say, hey, you ready to close this week? Or what do you mean? Well, yeah, we just got a five day CTC. So it gives you another way to impress. You're not only impressing your buyer, or your seller, if you trusted us with a mortgage or another great mortgage company, but you're looking to get referrals from every party. Now the listing agent, next time you go submit an offer and you say, hey, this is, this is my guy. Remember that last one they closed in five days? Trust me, I tell you, they'll take your offer. And trust me, I tell you, we're definitely calling that listing agent to let them know you can put us on blast if we don't close on time. Big, big thing there. Um, set up, you know, what we're saying is we'll go ahead and set up that file, get it in, get it, uh, again, imported that day to the lender to get that approval within 24 hours. Stop. Going. Um, so again, the next day you see approved conditions that day, once the approved conditions comes out, you, you can start that time, uh, that time that initial CD to start to start pulling off. What that means is a lot of times lenders will wait till they have the CTC or the clear to close, then they'll start that CD process and the CD out. Like, well, how can you close so fast? Well, we start that CD process immediately. A lot of cases we start that CD cooling process within 24 hours, 24 to 72 hours, which is great. So we're allowed to do that to be able to close that loan in that short time period. Once we get that clear to close, we notify all parties, you'll get a nice video. Um, and then we go ahead and set the closing. Like I said, once we do that, all parties are notified, listing agent, buyer's agent, buyers. Um, so it's nice because we have these automated videos that go out to keep you abreast of what's going on. Now, I'm going to go through the nitty gritty. I think sometimes Robo likes to see, okay, what are we doing in the back end? You as, you know, buyer's agent, seller's agent, you want to know, how does it actually look? Well, this is actually how a loan application looks. Can you see this pretty well, Robo, over there? Yeah, we're in chat too. Let's see. We're good. Yep, we're good. So this is an actual loan application. This is what you see when somebody fills out that application. They're going to ask pertinent questions about their marital status, the current address, where they're buying, where their business is, uh, asset information over here. If they have other sources of assets, other sources of assets again over here. You go to the second page. You'll see they'll ask questions about the EMD what their liabilities are. So this is all the information that's getting filled out. Next page, you'll see Humda information. Um, you'll see information that, you know, that asks them if they've had a foreclosure or a bankruptcy or things like that. So this is actually how a loan application works. And this is what you actually get filled in when they do submit a loan application. Can they interact to make sure there's no questions? There's a couple questions, yep. but it was for other things that you uh, had done before if you want to answer. So, 
Randy, we do have a questions that it's like applies from your previous slides. Do you want to address all the questions at the end? I, yeah, I can address all the questions that absolutely. Yeah, so we'll just keep putting them in the comments and then we're going to read them to you one by one at the end. That's perfect. And I'm sorry, guys, it's a little bit different because I'm not used to writing on the board. So I'm used to looking at you guys. So I'm looking at the camera. Uh, so it's a little bit different today, but it's okay. I think this is more important than you guys see what's on the board over here. Now, this is the, the, the thing that goes out when you, and when you get a loan in. You submit the loan in, and the client always wants to know, what are the fees? This is what's called the loan estimate. This is the thing that goes out before that CD or the closing disclosure comes out. The loan estimate itemizes all the fees involved with the loan transaction. When it comes to title, credit, appraisal, credits, taxes, escrow, down payment, all that good stuff. This is how it actually looks, okay? It tells you the kind of loan that you're, actually, I'm gonna mark this up. It tells you the kind of loan that you're getting over here. And if it's a fixed term, this says property information, when they got the loan estimate, sales price. This information here goes over the monthly payment, the loan amount, and the monthly principal and interest payment. If this was an escrow account, which it is over here, you see what the total payment with escrow is going to be. And then the breakdown of what the escrow is, is right over there. Over here, you see estimated closing costs. This item over here is actually broken down on the next page. And this is the estimated cash to close. Now, is this number finite? Absolutely not. This is pre-title. When title gets involved, tax prorations get adjusted and the escrow could get adjusted. We don't have title yet. We're giving estimates, right? That's why it's a loan estimate. So that being said, sometimes if they say, well, have things changed? Do things change? Yeah, but that's why it's important to not get a bait and switch lender that puts fake information in there to, to make it look like the closing costs are less, guys, because I hate to say it, but if you show lower tax prorations, lower escrows, it lowers your closing costs. And if you lower your closing costs to a person who's not very... Um, not very savvy when it comes to understanding loan estimates or bought multiple houses, they're not gonna understand closing costs or less because they misrepresented the taxes, they misrepresented title fees, they misrepresented, well, people will say, well, isn't there a cure? Yeah, there's what's called a tolerance cure. You can't grossly misrepresent too much in certain areas, but you know where you can, where it's easy, escrows and tax prorations. So ours are usually correct. That's why, um, you know, we, we, we just try to be as candid as possible as to what the closing costs are, but we do a really good job explaining to your clients, okay? And again, not just us, but any lender that you work with that acts uh, honestly and openly should be, should be doing this on a, on a regular basis. Going on the next page over here, this is where you typically see points being charged on a loan. What are points? Points are typically supposed to be a way for the borrower to pay money up front to get a lower interest rate. A lot of times, for example, you'll see competing lenders say they'll, to, to get our interest rates, the 5.375 or the 5.5%, they have to charge points. A point is calculated based off taking a percentage off of the loan amount, a $400,000 loan, one point would equate to $4,000 extra in fees, okay? A lot of lenders charge points as a typical practice to be competitive with us, and I'll show you why they have to do that, okay? This over here, this section, section B, covers appraisal, credit report, flood certs, final inspections, things like that. Section C covers title fees. These, this area, this area cannot be changed without triggering a tolerance cure. This area over here, transfer taxes, reporting fees, and then owner's policy, which is right over here. These over here are actually seller fees in many cases. They show us seller's fees, but we typically give seller credits. In this case, it's a new build and the seller, uh, the, the builder actually put it on the seller to pay. So you don't see a credit, which would be typically under here for seller credits, okay? This section over here covers homeowner's insurance. I'm gonna explain homeowner's insurance and escrow right now, just so you guys know how it works when your client asks you. When you're buying a new home, with our company, you can actually elect to waive escrow up to 97% on all conventional loans. Only FHA and government, you can't do that. But on all conventional loans, we can waive escrow up to 97%. So this section over here wouldn't even really apply. That being said, most lenders, most brokers throughout the United States don't have the ability to do that. I should say most brokers, but a lot of brokers don't have the ability to do that. So that being said, if you know money's the short, if cash to close is kind of short, remember we have the ability to waive that escrow. So now you want to put that extra three, four, five, six, seven, whatever thousand it is 
in the escrow account. But how is it figured out? Taxes in certain states and certain counties, depending on where it is, are due twice a year. You have county tax, city taxes, and county taxes. City taxes are usually the summer taxes, and county taxes are usually the winter taxes. Then you have your homeowner's insurance. In this case, I think we have $1,200 for homeowner's insurance. What happens is we have to set aside so much money in the escrow account based on the month of closing to jumpstart that escrow account. So that way, when the taxes and insurance come due, they automatically come from that account. Let's give an example here in Michigan, okay? We're in the month of July. Taxes come out 9-1, September 1st. Taxes are due within 60 days of that time frame. If a person closes their loan in August, they don't have their first payment due until October 1st. So that means we have to cushion the escrow to prepare to pay the taxes due in December. So for example, if October 1st, the first payment, we got to put 10 months in the escrow account for county taxes. And then if it's due in, again, in, I'm um, sorry, in, um, in uh, July for summer taxes, we have to put aside another five months of city taxes aside in that escrow account. So that way, when the taxes are due, we can take that money and pay them in full. Homeowner's insurance is the same way. People are like, well, if I just paid the whole homeowner's insurance up front, why am I putting aside another two months of homeowner's insurance? If you're taking the, the 1200 and paying that homeowner's insurance for a year, it should be all paid for. Well, that's not true. You're paying the insurance from August 1st to July 31st of next year. August 1st of 2023, homeowner's insurance is gonna be due again for the whole year. So we put aside two months because you're skipping essentially two months of a mortgage payment. But by, um, by uh, sorry, September 1st through July of next year, you have 10 more payments that are made on that account. So that way, when it comes next year, you'll have a full 12 months in that account to pay the homeowner's insurance also, okay? So that kind of gives you an idea of why we put so much money in that account. And at different times of the year, that changes because taxes and insurance uh, could be due at different times. Just want to keep, uh, keep that top of mind. Over here, you see something under where it says owner's policy, you see something called lender's credit. Okay. This was a situation, actually, it was a, a friend of GoGo's where she said, you know, can you help this guy out? Um, the builder's really not giving him a great deal. The builder not only was charging him points, but he was, they were giving him a, a crazy, crazy interest rate. Okay. In this case, what we did is we said, you know what, we don't believe that they're taking, they're, they're giving you a fair shot. We're going to, you know what, we're going to just earn your business. We're going to take a huge haircut. We're going to earn that business. We're going to give you back $8,885 back. That money is going to do two things. We know we're going to give you an FHA loan. So we're going to pay that mortgage insurance for you. And then also the builder is going to penalize you $4,000 for not using them. We're going to pick that up too, just because we want to show this builder we can close in 10 days. It's an FHA loan and we're going to do it better and we're going to do it cheaper than what he did. So that's where you'll see a lender credit. A lot of times I talk to you guys about lender credits. Well, how does that get on there? It's right here, right under that letter, lender credit section. Okay. What that lender credit does is it allows us to be as uh, competitive as we want to be. Any one of you call me and say, hey, Randy, we have to, you know, we have to beat this, uh, we have to beat this uh, other offer. And my client doesn't want to pay the extra 2000 Can you help? Or can we pick up a appraise? Can we do? We're never shy to take a haircut for you guys, especially on a relationship base. So we're always looking to help in any way you can. And that's where we're able to help. We're a correspondent lender. So it's a little bit easier for us to give credits versus uh, some of these other brokers out there. Okay, guys? Sample EU findings. When somebody says we got the loan approved already, this is what they're talking about. We're giving you a little bit of inside mortgage information, okay? We use like, how did you give a pre-approval? Well, we gave a pre-approval because we got them approved to something called DU. DU is an automated Fannie Mae system that tells you if a client can get approved for a mortgage. How do we know if we're getting an appraisal waiver? DU tells us. How do we know if we can get that client approved 97% loan to value with a 680 FICO? DU tells us. What makes us better than the next lender? Well, we know how to massage DU in a way that might get some loans uh, approved at a higher loan to value, but possibly than somebody else because we know what it wants and we put all that information in there. For example, client has half a million dollars in reserves. You don't enter that in, you might just shot your chance to get a higher loan to value with DU. Those are the kind of mistakes that we don't make here at National Mortgage Home Loans, and hopefully your preferred lender won't, those, won't, make, won't, uh, won't make those mistakes also, I'm sorry. What, are the, what is it asking for here? It tells you here, 
tells you here exactly what your loan to value is, what the DTI is, the debt to income ratio. Debt to income ratio, there's a front end and back end, right? The front end tells you exactly what your ratios are versus your monthly housing debts that appear, I'm sorry, your monthly debts that appear in your credit report versus your total overall gross income. The back end over here tells you, sorry, the front end tells you what the housing ratio, the back end tells you what it is with your other debts. So your total loan amount over here. So all that information is over there. Then it tells you, you know what? The risk, we're going to go ahead and approve this file. No appraisal waiver. The appraisal waiver appears here. This tells you if it's approved or not. Then I do have a quick question appraisal. on the debt to income ratio. What percentage yes. do they want to keep that under? So typically, FHA loans go to 50% with most lenders. With us, we can go to 56.99%. I've seen VAs get approved. Uh, a lot of times they say 45%. I've seen us get approved, get them approved with 61, 62%. Conventional loans, honestly, you've got them approved over 51%. Typically it's 43%. You take the test, they tell you 43%. We've got them approved 50, 51, 49% frequently. It goes by risk, right? So if that would mean, what if yeah. someone has like a very high, uh, let's say they're a doctor, right? And they have, they make very good money, but they also- so It doesn't take into consideration if you're a doctor, but it will take your income into consideration. Okay, perfect. So do they look, so they don't look at uh, school loans? So they, they will. So typically what they do, depending on if you get a doctor loan or, or not, which we do have that ability also, uh, Freddie will allow for half a percent of the total outstanding balances. So that means if it's, you know, whatever it is, they take half a percent, they take that, they divide it by the monthly payment. That's how you get that. If it's uh, DU, it's 1%. But that being said, if they're deferred on the credit report, we can defer them also. So if they show zero, I shouldn't say that. If they show zero payment, we could defer the payment also. Yeah, no, that's not my question. I had a client who was a pharmacist just out of school. She yep. had a school loan of 250,000 and her salary was 95,000. And we had a hard time um, getting her approved because her school loan was so high compared to her income. Yeah, I think that one you should call me about for sure. We probably help with that one. Okay. So it takes the risk consideration, for example, someone putting 3% versus someone putting 20%, someone having a 20% debt income ratio versus a 50% debt income ratio. So the, uh, someone having reserves, what that means is they have money in the bank for someone that doesn't have money. That's what will get someone qualified versus somebody else. But I'm going to jump through this. I didn't realize what time it was. So I'm going to go to, I'm going to, go to the, I'm going to actually jump through the sample VU findings and show you kind of how the rest. So this gives all the advice of the, of the findings. Sorry. What is DU? What is DU stand for? Uh, desktop underwriting. Okay. That's again. That's Fannie Mae's proprietary automated underwriting system, which is also known as in the US. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to fast forward through this. Like I said, I have 15 minutes, so a lot we got to go through. Um, I want to go through a sample appraisal really fast. This is another thing that comes up sometimes. We have issues with. I want you to understand. Uh, I guess from our perspective. A sample appraisal uh, on this appraisal it tells you kind of what we look for. So the first information is all the legal information about the property. The second page of an appraisal, can you guys see this or no? Yep. Yes, we can. Well, here's here's that second page. The second page, if you see over here, you have comparable section one, two, three, then it takes the information from the subject property, compares it. Under here, it says sales, uh, basically the value of the property, gives that right over here. Now on the next page, Usually in this section over here, if there was any like a uh, cost to cure or anything like that, it actually show it right over there. Then usually towards the end of the appraisal, it actually show some pictures of what needs to be fixed and an explanation by the appraiser. Okay. The next page is just again more legal jargon and things like that. More legal jargon, page two. Additional comparables in the back of the appraisal. And when, when people ask, I just want to explain this really quickly. This over here, if you see this section over here, these are the actual adjustments that you see on the appraisal. These adjustments are taken into consideration if anything is different than subject property. So you might have a deck or a bathroom on one, you get a, a, a negative or a positive adjustment, but they don't just take it off one, they take it off the accumulation of all the comparables used in there, just so you guys know. So when you ask what adjustments, these are the adjustments made. So if you think you had something, for example, a nicer kit, for example, you see this all the time. You see this, uh, you see this uh, C4 over here? This is the condition of the property. That C4, C3, C2, 
That's telling you if they, the comparables they use, for example, they say, well, all the condition, all the comparables were C4. And then, you know, you have a new kitchen, new, ba new uh, bathroom, stuff like that. And you see C4s across the board, you know, this appraiser didn't do his homework. So that's like one of the first things that we look at, you know, from our perspective. Okay. This again is more, so over here, again, more legal page of the property, explanations of what they said. Then over here, you have the sketch of the property. Now, these are the pictures of the property. So if there's any damage, anything like that, you'll see this, but this also shows you the condition of the subject property if it wasn't on the MLS for example. Sample title is not really important. I'm sorry, sample title. Actually, I wanted to go over one section that's not here. Uh, so there's another section over here that actually shows a sketch. This is one thing I want to tell you guys. There's an area that actually shows the comparables that they use for the property. So one big thing, whenever you're trying to get more comparables for that property, always use the same sampling area they use in the appraisal and then run your search in the MLS off the same thing and use those same comparables. Cause that'll tell you the proximity to the subject property. Very, very important. So when you're fighting an appraisal, make sure that you use the same area that they use and usually within the square footage, go three or 400 square feet uh, below or above that, okay? Now, this is how a sample title policy looks. A lot of times, you know, I, you know, we're realtors or, or loan officers, we don't look at these kinds of things. This is actually how the title commitment looks itself. On page two is actually where you see a lot of the pertinent information it tells about the loan amount, tells, you know, whose name the property is going to be and how it's going to be invested, the legal information on the property. It tells you what the summer taxes are. It tells you, this is where you see what outstanding encumbrances there are, if there's outstanding liens or taxes on the property. So it's very important to actually have a general understanding of the title. If we had more time, I'd actually go through it with you more, but we're kind of running tight. I want to answer these questions, okay, guys? Sample closing disclosure, very similar to how the loan estimate works, but this is actually how it works. This is the final information that's on, essentially what was called, what used to be called the HUD or the settlement statement. Now, this breaks down all the fees included on the loan, underwriting and processing, the appraisal, all those fees. Title fees are over here. It shows your prepaid items, your homeowner's insurance, your prepaid interest. Also shows your escrow account over here. And always remember, you have on the final CD versus the loan estimate, you have tax prorations that are included, which usually, you know, obviously the loan officer has to account for. That gives you another, you know, over here, in this case, $1,600. Then any credits, deposits, or any other credits, you know, from the seller would be in this section over here. The lender credit normally appears here, which is kind of cut out. This is if you're a lender, this is where you see that lender credit. So if you're a loan officer that you're working with, promise a lender credit, you see that on the second page of the CD. If you're looking for a seller credit, always go to the third page of the CD. Okay, guys? Now, what does partnering with us mean? So honestly, um, for the people that have done loans with us, removing stress and uncertainty, getting to close the table faster, being paid sooner. Speed is our number one asset and really knowledge of how to get a loan done. But speed is important because again, that gets you that next referral, okay? Now, this is something we don't roll out to everybody, but as we have a continuing relationship, we usually gauge it over 90 days. What do we do? Well, we try to help you with co-op events, networking events, things like that. As you send more loans over to the company, what we do is we say, okay, this relationship has been great. What can we do to further this person's efforts to grow their business? This is something usually, like I said, after 90 days, we gauge the level of business we've done and we say, okay, how can we help this partner grow? And this is determined after that 90 day period so we can kind of gauge how you like to do business and how we can grow together, okay? So it's really important, ask us about this and, or you know, if you don't like us for some reason or we're not in your state, ask your lender, but you should have a relationship going because if you want to grow your business, well then your loan officer or you know, whoever you're dealing with, that should be your business partner. So we're looking to be business partners with those people that want to grow their business. Our advantage, we have access to hundreds of products, wholesale interest rates and pricing, some of the lowest, and the turn times are two to three times faster. When we say two to three times faster, if you're dealing with some other people out there, they're closing in 30, 35, 40 days. Guys, we're consistently doing this in 10 days, nine days, 12 days. Our company average is 13 days. So really, really think about that. How will that help you get that next deal? How will it help you when you know, we call that listing agent and we solidify that deal for you? Or we get through some of the kinks that you, you know, that you dealt with or we massage it for you? That's, that's where we excel. That's where we'll help even more. So, All right. You guys have seen this before. Why not deal with them? I could probably talk for an hour about this, but I don't have the time to. 
Um, I won't mention them by name, but you can kind of infer the <laughs> message I'm, I'm saying there. Um, guys, this is a very, very big company. This is a company that posted roughly, I think it was $6 billion in profits first quarter alone. They don't do that by giving low interest rates. They have a behemoth of an operation. They have a real estate leg. They have a real estate company that works that they give leads to, but yet they try to befriend you and get your business. This is no different than any other lender in the United States that's not backing the broker channel or backing realtors. If you want to do yourself a favor, understand we're under heavy attack. The real estate industry, I've said this before, there's a lawsuit in Chicago. They're trying to mess with sellers, uh, I'm sorry, listing uh, our ability to charge or realtors ability to charge sellers a fixed 6% commission. And we don't have a lobby to fight these lawyers that are doing it. Well, the mortgage side is also under the same uh, attack. So we have to be careful, band together, stick with people that are protecting the broker channel, the, the, the realtor channel, but don't stick with people that you know, have a, a real estate leg and they're the largest, you know, potentially largest mortgage lender in the nation. Keep that in mind, please. Our mortgage insurance is cheaper. Average lender, where you can see this chart and take a picture of it, we're usually about 15 to 25% less on mortgage insurance. That's a huge reason right there. They say, well, they're giving me a lower interest rate. Well, make sure you double check that mortgage insurance or call us and we'll give you an idea of how much cheaper that mortgage insurance would be. Sometimes it saves a deal if we just have that cheaper mortgage insurance or they can get approved for more. Keep that in mind. Customized loan experience, guys. Cool thing about us is we have nine day, uh, nine year loans and we have 27, uh, 27 year loans. We have 16 year loans. Not a lot of banks do that either. We also have nine day, 10 day, 11 day loss, giving your client better pricing. So keep that in mind, customization. The banks can't do this stuff, but we can. So you, your client wants a 21 year loan? Well, we can make that happen. So keep that in mind also. And feel free to ask us, you know, what, what does that payment look like if they take less of a term? How much in interest do they save? So use that to your advantage. Well, I have a few slides. I hate to do this. I'm going to speed through because I want some time for questions. I know everyone, I want to respect everyone's schedule. These are the reasons why to use us. We talked about some of the stuff. Interactive technology, guys, you can actually go in and have a portal to see what's going on with your files. 10 day closings get paid faster. The co op program, we went over that. Lender credits, guys, help us. Help. So help us help you with that co marketing. Let's build a relationship so we can help you grow your business. Low rates, less fees. Just so you know, industry average is roughly 3%. 3%. So that means if you have a builder relationship or a bank relationship, they're pricing that loan at 3 to 4%. I'm going to be very clear. We price all of our loans at 2.125%. What that means is your client gets less in the, uh, on the interest rate side. Instead of having a 5.8 today, they have a 5.3 to 5.5. Now, if you, they want to get a higher interest rate, fine. They'll get a higher credit. If they want a 5.6 and they want 4,000, we'll work with that. But we have lower margins. We don't raise our margins per client. We try to give all your clients the best deal. And we do that almost on every single transaction that comes through the store. Keep that in mind, please. Incentives, free appraisals. Guys, everyone on this call right now, we just want to let you know, we have an incentive that we run every now and then for Go Listing. We're going to offer it to everybody on this call right now. You send us over a client, we're going to do a free appraisal for them today. Okay? Try us out. See how you like us. You might not, but I promise you, I think you will. So keep that in mind. Free appraisals, I'm going to run that go-go, honestly, for anyone uh, on your team that, that you give the okay to. We're running for all of next month, just so you know. Ah, if I give the okay to it? Okay. What's that? I said, if I give the okay to it, then you all have to be really nice to me. <laughs> yeah, that free appraisal, guys, it can be 500, 700, 750. Client pays for it. We give them a credit at closing. It's a great thing because how do you market that? You go tell, hey, National Mortgage Home Loan is going to help us with a free appraisal. You're ready to move forward with that deal. And you just save them some money. You pick up their inspection, we'll pick up their appraisal. They just save twelve to $1,500 in closing costs. It's huge. It's huge. All right. Means. Contact us today. This is our information over here. Um, this is where, you know, you can reach out anytime. That's our phone number. And then if you if you do want to sign up and you want us to call you, uh, this is a link that goes right to, this This goes right to yours, right, Gogo? What? This link over here? I don't know. Christy, if you, can, if you can, Christy, because I just realized it's, I can't click it. So go, so go ahead and post that um, if you can in the message chat. And if you guys, like I said, we'll reach out to you. We the next can't click it either. Yeah, What's Christy, that? can you post yeah, the link? But I have your Team GoGo -Go link. I'll post it right now. I posted it earlier, but I'll post it again. It goes right to this form. Awesome. Thank you. Perfect. Yep.
Randy, are you ready to open it up for questions? We have- I'm ready. Let's okay. do it. One, can you stop sharing so that we can see you on the screen? Yes, please. please. Yeah, Johnny's gonna do that right now, guys. Awesome. So question from Tina Reed on Facebook. Can you address the option of buying down the rate if you're buying agent? If you are a buyer's agent writing an offer for sellers to buy down the rate, how will that affect the interest paid over the life of the loan? How do we explain this option to the buyers negotiating with listing agent? You're fine. If you just step in front of that, Randy, we'll see you. No, I like to, I like to be able to see you guys if I can. Oh, got it. Okay. So pretty much asking how does, you know, buying back, buying down the rate would affect the interest rate? Would it affect the interest rate at all? And how do you explain oh, that? So that's a great question. But honestly, that's a question I'd, I'd give back to your loan officer. Uh, so you call us with that because, so you can figure out, there's a mortgage calculator. If you actually go and type that information, it'll actually give you what a buy down looks like. But be very careful recommending a buy down, right? So in today's market, for example, if the interest rates are five and a half and I just said, uh, and this is what I think, but I could be wrong. Interest rates are actually going to come down in the next year to year and a half. Well, if that's the case, interest rates are going to come down and you ask for a buy down, you got to figure where that break even point is, that area of diminishing returns, right? If you told them to pay 2% to buy down that interest rate and they're only saving 80 bucks a month, and let's say 2% is, I don't know, $300,000, $6,000, you got to figure where they're going to make back that $6,000. That's again, that break even point. And in that case, it could take 12 years. And I'm sorry to say this, but unscrupulous loan officers will sell origination or buy down points, not to save the client money, but to line their own pockets. So that's what I'm saying. So that's what I'm saying. Make sure that you're not dealing with an unscrupulous loan officer who's you know potentially misleading that client. So. Thank you. What about moving, uh, motivating the appraisers to move as fast as you guys do? So I'm really happy you asked that question, actually. Motivating the appraisers, you can't do. So unfortunately, loan officers can't legally talk. The loan officers can't legally talk to appraisers at all anymore. We can call what's called the AMC or the appraisal management company. The appraisal management company, we have multiple appraisal management companies that we deal with. So what we'll usually do, if you have a rush or something like that, we'll, call, we'll have our order person, uh, Melissa, back there. So go ahead and call multiple uh, appraisal management companies to make sure that, you know, who's going to give us that appraisal as fast as possible. Got it. Okay. So you're not necessarily talking to the one who's not available until next Thursday. You're going to find somebody else who's available tomorrow. Yep. So an appraisal management company, what they do is they actually go through, they have like a uh, AMCs are relatively a new thing, just got active less than, less than a decade ago. What they do is they take a bunch of appraisers, they group them under a company, and then the AMC or the appraisal management company gets a small fee to send that loan. So they actually appraisers actually make less now. They get a small fee for managing that appraisal and managing the expectation of that appraiser. That's why appraisers are always mad. Because they used to get 350, 400 a file. Now they get two to 250 a file after the AMCs got introduced. AMCs made more money, appraisers made less money. So now that's why you gotta you know, be real cool with the AMCs or have a really good relationship. For example, both CEOs of both AMCs we work with were on a first name basis with, I've known for over 20 years, so. Okay, can you educate on buying down the rate? How does that affect interest rate? Okay, we answered that, sorry. Do you have any, is there a husband? Okay, um, sorry, the Zoom keep jumping, so it goes all over the place with questions. Um, if there has been a foreclosure more than 10 years prior, does that have to be disclosed on his application? If so, will it disqualify the buyer if has all no, else is good? Has no bearing and doesn't have to be disclosed over 10 years, which is, which is cool. Uh, six and seven years, rule of thumb, just keep that in mind. Um, and that being said, uh, we can still get loans approved after four years on a foreclosure in a lot of cases. I mean, okay. in, 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 in even more cases, we have, you know, programs that are one day out of uh, foreclosure and bankruptcy, to be honest with you. Yeah. So. so pretty much you, rule of thumb, six, seven years, if they've been out of a foreclosure more than six, seven years, they should be good. That's exactly right. Well, well that being said, you know, uh, FHA has different rules. So if they're limiting that loan amount, you know, if they're, for example, if they're abiding by the, the, the HUD uh, loan limits in the area, the FHA loan limits in the area, there still are other options. That's why I say always call us. Like we've had clients that, you know, we couldn't, we just did a million dollar transaction. Client thought he couldn't get a mortgage. And we literally sent him to a lender who was allowed a one day out of, uh, one day out of foreclosure. One day out, the guy bought a million dollar house, but 30% down was able to get a home. So I, I, I always want to say like, don't try to make that decision. If you can, as a realtor, know what the general rule of thumb is. But always revert back to your to your lender because we have the ability to do loans that nobody dreamed of just three years ago. 
Yeah, because like sometimes even like, they... Even for example, like bridge loans, like we couldn't do a bridge loan a year ago as a broker. Today, we're one of the few brokers in the United States that's ability to do a bridge loan, which is crazy because now it gives the it gives your client, you know, you, you take the contingency off now, right? So you, you, you go into a contract with a contingency to sell your home, you know what's happening. If there's six or seven offers, you're in trouble. You're not going to get your offer accepted. Well, we can remove that contingency by offering a bridge loan now, which is kind of cool. So, you know, knowing that you can do that kind of stuff really helps you win that next offer. Awesome. Next question. It's my question. You yeah. said a point is worth $4,000. Who decides what a point is worth? Ah, so great question. So it's a percentage of the loan amount. For example, 1% on a $400,000 loan. Oh, got is, it. Okay, got it. So one point, meaning it's 1% of whatever price range you're shopping in. So if they're a million dollar price range home, then it's $10,000 for one point. That's exactly right. I wanted to go over pricing with you, but I, got, I kind of ran out of time. Let me just explain this really fast. Today, if you have a 780 borrower, 780 FICO score, buying a house for $500,000, putting 20% down, that would be a $400,000 loan amount. Okay. On that kind of loan, essentially at 5.375% gross pricing, that means what the bank is paying you before any loan level price adjustments. I know it's a lot of information there. Gross pricing would be in that case, two and a half percent. You'd have a half point loan level price adjustment. That is uh, something that makes the pricing go down more because of a factor, for example. It's another $10,000 that the buyer has to bring to the table? No, no. So this is what the loan officer, again, I'm giving you inside information. It's what the loan officer would make. So essentially- well, the loan officer it. makes two and a half percent of the loan price, got it. Well, it goes down to 2% in this case because there's a loan level price adjustment for FICO and for loan to value. So it goes down to 2%. Now the loan officer makes on that loan, $400,000 loan, 780 borrower, 20% down, 5.375%. They make 2%. In that case, it's $8,000. Yeah, so- yeah. Now here's the thing, right? That $8,000, is that a lot of money? I guess it's relative to how the loan is, but what we'd like to do is we like to say, hey, if we're making 8,000, let's, let's do something to sweeten the pot. Let's pay for this guy's appraisal. Let's give him a $1,000 credit, $2,000 credit, especially on a relationship. We're looking to make you look better. So instead of us taking that extra money, especially if it's a referral from you, how do we find a way to either take that money, reinvest it in you or reinvest it back into the borrower? Those are the biggest differences. And, and you know, $200,000 loan, $100,000, we don't have as much leeway because if you make 2% on a $100,000 loan, that's $2,000. So it barely covers the cost of the staff. But on, on larger loans, we have more ability to give back lender credits. Unfortunately, we want to give back as much as we can, but we're limited because, on, like I said, lower loan amounts, you're not really yeah. able to give much back because there's not much money being made there. So. Yeah. Plus you have expenses too. Okay. So did we, I mean, I think we kind of covered, but does, it, does that increase interest rates if you're waiving escrow? No, cool thing. A lot of banks, it does. For us, we don't. We don't. We don't charge you for that. So a lot of banks will charge you a quarter point, eighth of a point on the rate, not the pricing on the rate. We actually have no hit for waiving escrows, which is crazy though if you think about it. We can waive escrows to ninety-seven percent loan to value. Almost, I would say, I got a venture to say ninety percent of banks in the United States can't waive escrows over eighty percent loan to value. We're able to waive them up to ninety-seven percent loan to value. So that's a huge benefit. For example, property taxes are $15,000 where you're at. When you're closing in summer and you have to pay another twelve dollars or $13,000 in closing costs. You're like, you know what? I don't have it now. I'm going to get a bonus. You know, I can pay it later. Well, go ahead and pay it later with us because you can go ahead and waive that escrow, forget about that escrow account, and then save that twelve dollars or $13,000. Again, sometimes it saves deals. You know, we can make a lot of last minute changes. Fortunately, again, we're a correspondent lender. We're not held to the same standards as every other broker in the United States. We lend our own money. So if we need to make some last minute changes, things like that, we can do it and still get that loan closed same day. So that's kind of cool. Um, I thought mortgage insurance was a standard private. <laughs> okay, let me try this again. I thought mortgage insurance was a standard price based on loan amount. How can we save on Michigan with you? I'm not, can, how can we save? Jesse, I'm not sure I understand your question. Do you want to ask it in person? Are you still here? Okay, sorry. Um, I don't understand. So let, me, let me give you the short answer to that. We have the cheapest mortgage insurance in the country, hands down, no questions asked, not even close. Cheaper than every single bank out there, cheaper than everybody else. We have the cheapest mortgage insurance. It's a set cost in almost all circumstances, except that we have a preferred relationship with United Wholesale Mortgage. 
to me, in my opinion, largest wholesale lender in the nation. They were able to work a deal directly with the higher ups, we'll call them, to give us lower mortgage insurance. So, you know, a lot of times um, it's not pound for pound. We do have the chart. I can share that chart with you. Um, so I can go ahead and post that in the link. Maybe Johnny, you could do that when you have a chance or Mary Ellen, so. Awesome. And I, and I read MI as Michigan. I guess MI is mortgage insurance. So yeah, there's MI, mortgage Excuse insurance. Me. Or, 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 P, or PMI. One thing yeah. I'm going to hit on a little really fast, and I want you guys to know why a lot of times, just so you guys know, again, I had to rush through this. I didn't expect us to take this much time, but I want you to know the difference between conventional and FHA loans uh, really fast regarding that mortgage insurance. FHA uh, mortgage insurance, you can't change it. It's standard across, okay? Conventional loans, yes, you can, okay? Uh, also, jumbo loans. We have products where we don't have any mortgage insurance at 90% loan value. Keep that in mind. But FHA loans are actually fixed, okay? FHA loans are fixed at, there's something called upment or upfront mortgage insurance premium, and then there's MMI, monthly mortgage insurance premium, okay? The upment is 1.75% of the loan amount, okay? $100,000 loan, that's $1,750 that goes directly to HUD. We don't get a penny of it, it goes right to HUD. And it's actually not take, it's not added as a physical closing cost where they got to bring it to closing. It's actually added to the loan amount. So the loan amount on FHA is 96.5%. They actually add that to that loan. So you actually have an, uh, an adjusted loan to value. If you really look at it, it's usually closer to 97.5%. Uh, the alpha is actually added. They take their money right up front. They don't get that money back if they refinance something like that. Then you have upfront mortgage insurance premium at 96.5% loan to value. It's 0.85% of the loan amount. So on a $100,000 loan, $850 a year, divide that by 12, that's your mortgage insurance for the year. Um, conventional loan, 95% loan to value, for example, or 90%, you don't have any upfront mortgage insurance premium. And that more, that monthly mortgage insurance is usually about 30% of what the monthly mortgage insurance is on an FHA loan. Please keep that in mind. Now FHA loans, again, they allow foreclosures, bankruptcies, you know, after, after uh, half the time that a conventional loan allows. But remember, it is a more expensive loan. So you have a lot of companies they don't understand. Like, for example, we can do a 680 FICO score, conventional loan, whereas we just had a bank with somebody in an FHA loan that was thousands of dollars more. Well, in our, in our belief, we don't believe in that. But the reason they do that is so they can give them an FHA loan, then refinance them to a conventional loan of six months to a year. We want to give them that conventional loan right away. Again, this is just another key difference. So, Awesome. So I think I read all of the written questions. Do we have um, any verbal questions that you want to mute yourself, unmute yourself, I mean? I was asking a question. Hi, Randy, it's Melinda. Hi. Hi. Who is that, Nancy? Um, it's Melinda. You know, What's Melinda. Up, who are you? What's up, Hi, Melinda? Darling. Hi. So um, I had thrown out assumable loans and it was just kind of like a generic question. Maybe I don't know. I might have it wrong, but I heard as we move forward and these interest rates grow, that assumable loans will become more popular because our buyers can assume. And I might have this wrong. Assume the interest rate that our seller had that a seller had. So a, they could assume a 1.75 rate or is that true? Is that a thing? So assumable loans aren't a thing anymore unless you're going with an FHA loan and they still have to re-qualify. Keep that in mind. Conventional loans don't allow them anymore. Certain small lenders, certain small banks will allow them. I want you to keep in mind something though. Uh, banks are greedy. Assumable loans, they don't make more money on. They want you to redo that loan. So they actually stopped doing assumable loan on conventional loans roughly about 15 years ago. Okay. But FHA loans, a lot of cases, especially an older loan, you get an older conventional loan, an older FHA loan, after current FHA loan, there still are clauses in there where they still can be potentially assumable, meaning the new borrower can requalify or doesn't even have to qualify and assume that old low interest rate over. But again, if that loan is 12, 13, 14 years old, um, that rate was probably higher anyway. So probably better to get a, a new loan. Maybe so it's just podunk, yeah. uh, maybe it's just small podunk, West Virginia. <laughs> I, I, you might have someone in West Virginia that, that it works. I'm going to pick up the phone now and talk. So. Okay. Um, so really fast. Another thing, actually, since you brought up assumable loans, I'm going to bring up uh, something called recasting. You're going to do that? Okay, good. We well, can do it that way. I'm yeah, sure. I, I think I kind of like about that. I can All right, here we go. So recasting is something a lot of times we, we get the question. Can I take it? Yeah, you can uh, take it. Yeah. We, 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 get, we get that question. What happens if you have a loan, somebody you know pays off their house? Can they go ahead and pay a big chunk 
of the new mortgage down? Can they pay a big chunk of that down without refinancing? I said I have to rejoin. No, you're good. We good. see you. So what happens is, for example, I just took a four hundred thousand dollars loan when I sold my house, and I have a hundred thousand dollars in equity. I have a hundred thousand I took out. Can I pay down my current mortgage? Crazy thing is, you can. It's something called recasting. You can actually take that hundred thousand dollars that you got out, and you can actually pay it towards your current mortgage principal, and it'll actually figure what your new uh, figure what your new payment is with the same remaining term of the loan. So let's say you have twenty eight years left. You can actually have 28 years left. They'll give you a new payment. If your principal is 400,000, they'll now give you the, the new payment on the 300,000, which is another great, you know, great thing that we have. But a lot of a lot of banks do allow that too. So what is this one called? Okay. A recasting. It's called recasting. Yep. Okay, never heard of it. So it's actually it, it's a cool option because sometimes people are like, well, I got two hundred thousand dollars out, um, but I want only was hundred, and I want to pay down the balance. And I want the lower payment. So it's great for that reason because you know it lowers their payment automatically, um, and it, it doesn't off the remaining term. But again, an unscrupulous loan officer will be like, well, no, you can't do that. You have to refinance because they get paid on a refinance, but they don't get paid on a recasting. Got it. Well, that's why we work with you guys. Well, yeah. I, have a question. I think. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Kat. Hey, I have a quick question. I know, What's Randy. Up, Kat? Hey. I know you're going right. to close this VA loan quick for us, but I was just wondering in general how long it takes you guys to close a VA loan. So typically, uh, so our average term time on, on Govy loans, and it's only because Govy loans take longer um, because we have to go through directly through the VA to choose their appraiser. Um, we've been averaging 15 days on VA loans as long as the suburban area uh, areas, for example, farm towns. Um, you know, it takes longer because it takes longer to get the appraiser out there. So we've been noticing in those kind of areas, it's taken roughly 23 days. Actually, we have another seven or eight days to get added on. Um, that being said, though, suburban areas, we're, we're still averaging 13 day CTCs. Hey, Kat, this is Johnny. I'm still waiting for your shirt size. Please text me. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get back to that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you should have given me the pretext before you said that. <laughs> Well, oh, we have another question. Yes. yes. Uh, Randy, is that the, Jeremy? Yeah. Hey there. On the recast, is there a um? Do they have to wait a couple months before they're able to do that? And then are they only allowed to do that once? So they're allowed to do it twice during the life of the loan, and okay. with some of our lenders, we can do it immediately after. Okay. Uh, it has to be done within the first year, though. The okay. First time. All right. Thank you. Oh, Great so the. Okay, so the first recast has to be done in the first year. What if you are 11 years into your mortgage and you never done a recast because you didn't know it existed? Now what? So if, you, if you've never done a recast? Yeah, I thought you said the first, you can do it twice in the life of the loan. That's not what I meant. I'm completely wrong. You have to wait oh. one year for the first recast. Oh, you can God. do it as many times you want there. I'm okay, sorry. I thought you said it has to be in the first no, year. No, you can like, do it up out. to two times. <laughs> up to two yeah. times. It costs, I think, like 350 bucks. You pay it right to the lender directly, but you have to wait one year to do your first recast. With certain lenders, I have ones that do six months wait time on it, but you can do it two times for the life of the loan afterwards. Got it. Thank you. Okay. All any right, other guys. questions? Who's that? I'm asking if anybody has any other questions. I know we went a little over the hour, but usually these open to the public ones go longer because we have more people. And I don't know. I like it. I mean, I, honestly, in today's market, guys, we should have a lot of questions. And the cool thing is you can call me directly. You can email me. You know, Gogo knows I'm always available. Number's right over there, I think, somewhere. I feel like I'm a, I feel like I'm a weatherman. Like, I don't know which <laughs> What's uh, the weather so today, said, really? Sorry? I said, what's the weather today? The weather? Oh, yeah. over there? Now you're just trying to rub it in my face, aren't you? <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much for being here today, guys. There's Randy's phone number on the screen. We also have the link if you would like to have a consultation with them. Christy included it a couple of times into the chat box. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks for having me. And thank you, Randy, for being here and sharing your knowledge. And look at this fancy presentation. I love it. I don't know. It was, it was tough going back and forth. You know, I'm an old school guy. I was going to pull up my notebook and draw on that. <laughs> <laughs> you are growing up. I love it. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. See All right, guys, see ya. All right. Go get them. Thank you, thank you, thank you.